this episode is going to be a little bit different. The structure is the same, but my guest, Alan Palander, unlike previous guests so far, is not necessarily a coffee professional, at least not in the conventional sense, but he is a very good friend of mine and someone that I've looked up to for a very long time for his way to take any professional situation and creatively turn it into something even better for everyone involved. We did also partner on a small coffee project back in Toronto a few years ago, so there's still a coffee connection. Don't click away. (laughs) Alan is a photographer, filmmaker, creative director with an Instagram following of just over 800,000 and a YouTube channel with almost 200,000 subscribers. Meaning, why do I say this? I do believe he's done a really good job at honing his niche and building an audience who is always looking forward to what he's going to do next, specifically in the areas of travel, lifestyle, automotive, architecture, fashion, you can check out his profile to see what I mean. For those who are just listening without the visuals, Alan and I are just about to sit down in my home in Barcelona to make a coffee with the Cup of Mocha pour over kit from Wokako. Wokako is the sponsor of this episode and with their whole lineup of different coffee brewers that are all handheld, hand powered, ultra portable, they are perfect for these two world travelers. So to support this podcast, Please check out their links in the description. And with that, let's get right into it. Alan Palander. Great to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brody. I like these microphones. <laughs> They're very compact. Yeah. They're very uh, useful and travel worthy. As you know, you travel a lot, so you need to sometimes pack pretty light. Yeah, a travel companion. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to make some coffee. Are you yes, ready? I am ready. Um, always ready. Forgot my coffee over there. Wait. That's probably a good starting point. <laughs> we need to start with the, the grounds. Why don't you pour it in? Okay. So, Alan, you are a creative professional working in photography, working in media, but not necessarily working with coffee. Do you remember your, your first time crafting a coffee like this? Crafting a coffee? Ooh. I mean, I remember when I was younger, supporting my parents in the kitchen a little bit. Ah. Um, but we don't make coffee like this. Uh, we make Turkish styled coffee, so it's a very delicate process. Um, but I think uh, you, in many ways, have introduced me to various different forms of brewing, um, and that's been super exciting because I had no clue that coffee can be nurtured in so many different ways. Um, and it's been super exciting just to see the differences in like processes and the different type of uh, taste that you can kind of create, um, which most people probably don't even realize. But like if you're a Starbucks coffee person, you're going to be, you're missing out on a lot essentially is what <laughs> I'm trying to say. Because um, the taste here changes uh, depending on how you obviously go about processing the, the coffee beans and um, and that's always been exciting for me. It's so a learning des- process. Describe to everyone who's listening, there might not be on the video, but w- how is the coffee that we're brewing right now different from what maybe you grew up with, with Turkish coffee? So Turkish coffee, the extraction process, there isn't one. You're boiling the coffee grain within the same pot and you're actually pouring it into the cup. So at the end of uh, the the tasting, you actually still have the sedimentation of the coffee itself at the very bottom. Um, And historically, this is just a a process that they've done for many years. In Armenia, they actually um, will brew it over um, hot sand and in parts of Egypt as well. So it varies across the Middle East. But yeah, so you still have the sedimentation of the coffee bean and the coffee grain, and you can kind of take that in as well when you're drinking it. Um, And then if you're someone who's obviously into magical world of... uh, of trying to figure out your future, they they do coffee readings. And that's another cultural yeah. practice that has kind of uh, increased in more in popularity over the years. Uh, and actually, funny enough, in my family, I was always the coffee reader. Um, and it had a lot to do with, I guess, my creative perspective. And I could see images. I couldn't tell your fortune or your future, but I could see, visualize images and create cool concepts so that's the main difference this is extracting and you have a filter you know there's really very little sedimentation that's being uh, taken into the, the coffee itself 
Um, also, the brewing process here, the extraction process is different. You're pouring hot boiling water over it versus boiling it on top of a stove. So, Yeah. So I don't know if everyone can hear the, the dripping happening, but we are actually making a pour over. And for those who are watching our video right now, we are using the cup of mocha uh, from Wakako. As you know, Wakako is a sponsor of this podcast. And it's something that's also very portable, just like these microphones, um, because it folds up into a cup and, and you can make a, a filter coffee. So this is a yeah, like as I mentioned, a pour over sort of a V60 style method, which, as you mentioned, is very different from the the Turkish style. But you're not you're not Turkish, so what? Why is uh, where are you from? I'm from many places in the world. No, I'm kidding. Um, well, you know where I'm from, but I guess they wouldn't. I'm from Iraq originally. Um, I'm Babylonian by descent, uh, so we have very different uh, food and cultural practices and the way that we enjoy beverages in terms of um, you know coffees or teas is very very unique um, we have a very big tea household um, I grew up drinking five six teas a day <laughs> and we have uh, what we call stikans which are very very small kind of similar size to this but maybe thinner um, little cups that you pour, you're, you're getting very little doses of, of tea, so it's not like you're drinking massive quantities. Um, but what's been interesting is being in, the, in North America, the, the quantity of tea or coffee that we consume is very, very different than what we do in the Middle East, because uh, Turkish coffee is very, very small, you know, and you have one after a very big meal, or you have one sometimes in different settings. So actually at funerals, uh, they will walk around when everyone arrives with Turkish coffee. Um, and I'm not too sure exactly why that practice happens, but there's certain specific times when coffee is served. It's not like with North America, you go to someone's house and they ask you, do you want coffee or tea? Uh, we don't do that. We just bring tea right away. And then water. No questions asked. No questions asked. And then if you're done eating and everything, then the coffee yeah, arrives. Yeah. Well, the coffee has arrived for us right now. Uh, cheers. <laughs> cheers, brother. We just finished brewing up a really nice natural Brazil. So for those listening who haven't heard of uh, different coffee processes, a natural is basically when the coffee is picked, the, the cherry, you know, the cherry is picked from the tree, but then they leave the, the cherry out to dry the, so that basically the, the fruit is drying around the seed and then they take it off once it's dry. So that actually brings in a lot of the uh, flavors of the fruit, a little bit of that, I don't know if you can taste it here, but of that fermenty yes. type flavor as opposed to maybe a sort of a crisp chocolatey, uh, this has some chocolate notes to it as well. What do you think? So it, it does taste a little soury to me and I can see why because if you're leaving the seeds out for long enough mm -hmm. I feel like they would naturally start to produce some sort of acidity to yeah. them. Um, I'm not a big acidity coffee drinker. I really like soft, very light coffees or extremely dark, dark coffees. Oh, okay. I, the, for some reason, I don't know why. I think it's because also maybe um, I used to mix a lot of different things in my coffee, so whether it's going to be oat milk or if I'm making a latte or so on and so forth. Um, but the middle ground for coffees always don't sit well with my stomach. <laughs> mm. um, I have a very sensitive stomach, unfortunately. So it's either I go very, very dark roast and heavy or I go very light. The middle area where it's acidic or anything like that, it doesn't sit well with me, but this smells amazing. So the aromas yeah, the there. Aromas, yeah, yeah, you can you can really take that in. Uh, this pour over actually thing is really nice as well. Waku, ba waku. Wakako, <laughs> cup of mocha. Um, and this like closes down into it. Or? Yeah, it closes down into the into the cup, so you can take it as a as a travel mug. Oh, that's smart. So a lot of their other products are more espresso based. So if you prefer espresso or yeah. like a latte, then you have that. But this is uh, this is more of their filter brewer. You know? Somehow I can picture you on an airplane just pull, opening this up and being like to the flight attendant, hey, can I get some hot water? <laughs> Looks like you've been you looking at my, that. my Instagram. Oh, you've done it? Yeah. Oh, damn. Okay. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't watch my Instagram, but I've been watching yours. <laughs> and, for uh, a very long time. <laughs> for a very long time. I want to get back to that. So uh, we'll come back to the coffee, of course. Um, yeah. But... We have a few shared coffee adventures together, but before that, mm -hmm. we have a lot of uh, shared photography experiences together. So I know when I, so I met you in 
first year, second year of university over in, in Waterloo, Canada, and we were studying urban design. And uh, yeah, both of us somehow got into photography. I, I definitely think you were into it first. And while I was in China, I was starting to, to investigate more about photography, video, and we kind of just kept in touch during that time. And I remember you, you were like, oh, you should start an Instagram specifically for your photography. And I had noticed yours at the time. You were sitting around like, this is back in 2013. You were around like 6,000 followers and you were posting a lot of your travel photos. Um, I think your, your username was City Charm at the time. City Charm. Shout out to, to oh, the OG. Shout out to the OG. <laughs> City, City Charm. Charm. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I mean, that was a big part of our our travels and, and lifestyle was like being in the city, architecture, yeah. urban design. Um, and so that's kind of where I remember you starting, like launching your your passion for photography, for travel, for storytelling. 100%. Um, can you recall that specific moment where, you know, I, I mentioned 6,000 6, followers, but, you know, where, how did that feel at that time back in 2013 to have sort of an, an online presence surrounding your photography? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. I'm, I think going back in time, I started to, I, I've tried to do this many times before where I just kind of dive deep into memory lane to figure out what was actually happening so long ago that got me to where I am today. But what essentially was the situation was that I was in a program where I didn't want to be in. I wanted to be an architect. I was, my entire life was like, planned out that I would become an architect one day and architecture was like my, uh, I don't know, my one and only direction. But in urban design school, I didn't feel creatively challenged. And I was always trying to experiment in different art avenues of ways to express myself creatively. Um, I tried painting, I tried designing things I tried I don't know I tried so many things I just remember being in my parents house and just going crazy being like I don't know what else I want to do I just I just don't feel like this this program is giving me the creative outlet that I wanted and then I really got into photography because I remember growing up my dad used to take photos of us and he used to do it as a like a side hustle sometimes where you take pictures of friends and their weddings and stuff like that but it was a very faded memory um but when I started traveling which was very young at age, I um, I would come back and I didn't have any images to share. And my dad got me my first camera. My sister helped, I think, with that as well. Shout out to the mom. She's the best. Um, and yeah, so that opened up a new portal for me where I was able to create art in a different form, in a different media. And with it came a lot of experimentation and this whole new online presence thing was a part of it. Um, being on Instagram was a huge turning point for, for me in terms of photography because it challenged me now to take into consideration strangers' perceptions of my work. Um, but at that time, you couldn't really do much. It was no comment section. It was just likes and that's it. Um, oh, really? There was no comments back then? There was no comments. It would just say, this is how many people liked your photo and there was no other thing that would indicate. I don't think there was even DMs at that time. There was there literally the platform was very very simple. It was just yeah. post a photo, get a like, add a filter, and that's it. Um, and there were no other apps on the platform or on your devices to let you edit your photos. So I was editing my photos on my laptop on Photoshop, and then somehow sending them to my phone. Wasn't there a moment before you were even allowed to upload photos that were not taken on the app? I remember that was a restriction. It was that that was kind of the 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 community of like iPhone only mm. because you could only upload what you were taking in the app. I don't remember that specifically, but maybe I think maybe very very early on. Um, and then it shifted quickly to being able to upload your own photos. Yeah, it it shifted very fast. I was actually part of the the community that was getting questioned on a monthly basis of how did we like the updates? Did we have any recommendations? So Instagram at the time, at the time, really cared about us. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much anymore. But yeah, we were, I, me and a whole bunch of other creatives, we were, we were helping to develop the, the pathway for this app and how it would interact with all different aspects of social media. Yeah.